Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God for our consideration this Ash Wednesday evening as we begin our season of Lent are words from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 18. I begin reading at verse 4. Then Jesus, knowing everything that was about to happen to him, went out and said to them, Who is it that you are seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. I am he, Jesus told them. Judas, who betrayed him, was also standing with them. When Jesus told them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Who is it that you're seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. I told you, I am he, Jesus replied. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This is to fulfill the words he had said, I have not lost one of those you have given me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. At that, Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword away. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? This is God's word. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it's time to make, take matters into my own hands. Maybe you've never said those words just that way before, but you are familiar with the frustration that they express. Someone that you're depending upon isn't getting the job done. You've run out of patience with them. Maybe it's someone at work who procrastinates on a project. They avoid the tasks they were given. They, they won't contact the necessary people. It's time to take matters into my own hands. Maybe it's someone you have hired to fix something. Your car, your plumbing, some electrical issue with the house. Their work never solves the problem. You're tired of paying them, but you have to keep taking the car back in or schedule another appointment to meet them at the house. It's time to take matters into my own hands. For Peter, three years of following Jesus had meant watching Jesus' gentle and easy way. Jesus defended his truth against his enemies, it's true, but he didn't seem to be preparing for the literal military battles that were necessary to establish the Messiah's kingdom in Israel. Now his enemies were coming for him with clubs and swords, and Jesus was doing practically nothing but having a little conversation with them. It's time to take matters into my own hands, Peter may have thought. He didn't say those words, but his actions in the Garden of Gethsemane made his intentions loud and clear. Simon Peter wasn't trying to contradict his Lord. He wanted to defend him. But reaching for his sword made his hands Hands of misguided zeal. Peter's actions are driven by misguided zeal because Jesus had the power to prevent his arrest. He was giving himself up, and he intended to drink the cup of suffering. You may not know who Edward Bulwer Lytton was, but you know one of his most famous quotes, The pen is mightier than the sword. Words are often more powerful and more effective than physical force. But with Jesus, this is literally true. Then Jesus, knowing everything that was about to happen to him, went out and said to them, Who is it that you are seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. I am he, Jesus told them. Judas, who betrayed him, was also standing with them. When Jesus told them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Have you ever seen a toddler throw a tantrum in the aisles at Walmart or some other store? They may flail their arms and legs, kicking and even hitting at their parents. Are you ever tempted to intervene to protect mom and dad from the child? Would you, if the parents were obviously athletic and muscular, 
What if you could tell that one of the parents was carrying, that they had a firearm on them? Do you need to step in to protect the parent from an angry two-year-old? The picture of Peter stepping in to defend Jesus from the men who came to arrest him with a few steel blades and wooden clubs is rather pathetic. They had less power against Jesus than the little juvenile in the grocery store aisle pounding on mom or dad's shins with his chubby fists. A word from his mouth, from Jesus' mouth, and they all fell over. It's like the psalmist writes, God lifts his voice, the earth melts, or, or perhaps like Job's words of observation, they perish at a single blast from God and come to an end by the breath of his nostrils. Jesus was holding back. He was showing mercy to the men who had gathered to arrest him. He could have vaporized the entire crowd in an instant. Instead, his words merely pushed them to the ground. He had plenty of power to prevent his arrest. He didn't need Peter's help. Like Peter, we love Jesus. We deplore injustice. The people who reject Jesus, mock his teachings, belittle his importance, attack his followers, or betray and corrupt his faith sometimes make us mad. We're tempted to fight, even to use force to defend our Lord. There is a time for polemics and a place for that. Going on a verbal attack when Christ's teachings are being denied or perverted. Even then, we need to police our words so that they don't become abusive. Years later, this same Peter in our lesson wrote that we should defend our faith with gentleness and respect. But nowhere are we called upon to defend our Lord's honor or teaching with physical force. Events from history like the Inquisition or pogroms of the Jews or violent persecution against heretics and unbelievers repeats Peter's sin on an even larger scale. They're committed by hands of misguided zeal. Jesus still does not need us to defend him. He has the power to prevent being mistreated without any help from us. What Peter failed to recognize in this instance was that Jesus was giving himself up. Then he asked them again, Who is it that you are seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. I told you, I am he, Jesus replied. So if you are looking for him, let these men go. This was to fulfill the words he had said, I have not lost one of those you have given me. The time for Jesus' disciples to become martyrs would come but not like this, not in a battle that killed some of the very souls Jesus had come to save, not by standing in the way of the work Jesus came to do, not before they fulfilled their true purpose, spreading the gospel around the world to people who do not know God's saving love. Jesus was not concerned about his own safety at this moment. He wanted only to secure the safety of the man who had followed him. He had made it clear that he was one of the enemies, he was the one the enemies of his were looking for. I am he, because he fully intended to give himself up. Thus, Jesus makes it clear that he was a willing participant in everything that follows. That does not excuse Judas's betrayal or the evil intent of the Jewish leaders. They were looking only to hurt Jesus and serve themselves. They were unwilling to turn from their hateful plans, but Jesus takes even the sins of his enemies and turns them to serve his loving plans. Jesus' willingness not only to be arrested, but also to endure the hostility and violence against him that steadily grew with each new stop along the way to the cross, the, the Jewish court, the Roman court, and finally the crucifixion itself is a testimony to his love. 
He gave himself up to it all. Love that is forced is no love at all. Parents can force their children to share, to apologize, and to say that they're sorry to each other. Just because the behavior changes, just because the right words are said, doesn't mean that genuine love has been produced and everyone is full of warm feelings all of a sudden. Governments can force their citizens to give to the poor and support the needy through their taxes. It may be necessary to avert catastrophe or to maintain an orderly society. That does not mean that the rich and the poor have suddenly become dear friends and will be inviting each other over for backyard barbecues and showing up at each other's weddings. No one forced Jesus to go to the cross. Not even the men who arrested him. He gave himself up because he loves us that much. Peter's violent intervention, his uh, attempt to stop Jesus' arrest, could only get in the way of his love. Hands that tried to force Jesus' escape could only be hands of misguided zeal. Jesus was giving himself up because he fully intended to drink the cup of suffering. And Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. At that, Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword away. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? Life is a strange mix of good and bad. doesn't always, or usually, go the way we planned. We may pour our heart and soul into having one kind of life, one kind of career, one kind of family, one kind of lifestyle, and then reality happens. We don't control all the opportunities or experiences that come our way. God chooses to give us something we didn't expect. One way the Bible illustrates this experience is the phrase, Drink the cup. It pictures the Lord pouring our experiences into a cup and sliding it across the table for us to drink. Will we take what we are given or will we try to find something else? We are pre-programmed to reject pain, to avoid discomfort. At this moment, my medicine cabinet contains a half dozen products with little health value beyond pain relief. I brush my teeth with a toothpaste that desensitizes them to pain from cold foods or drink. Desensitizing them isn't something that has a real benefit for making them last longer or look whiter. It simply makes them feel better. It makes me feel less uncomfortable, less pain. Now, there's nothing wrong with relieving the pain we experience in our lives so long as we can do so without compromising our faith or our morals. But I don't like to drink God's cup when it involves pain I cannot avoid. It's not that Jesus liked pain either or felt it less deeply than we do. His arrest and trials offended his sense of justice. The the beatings made him sore. The lash of the whip and the thorns piercing his forehead stung and burned. The cross cramped his muscles, cut off his wind, and made him desperate for air like any other crucifixion did. But he intended to drink the cup of his suffering, willingly, all for the love of you and me, our salvation, our forgiveness, our eternal future, These things were a greater concern for him than his own comfort. Let the disciples go. Let the future masses be saved. Let his own life be given up. But hands that got in the way of all of this were hands of misplaced zeal. It is in another gospel writer's book, Luke, who tells us that 
Jesus healed the servant's ear after Peter cut it off. It is the very last miracle Jesus performs before his crucifixion. Jesus' hand touched the man, and he was healed. Jesus' hands have zeal too. Zeal guided by his mercy and by his love. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.